I'm going to be talking to you today about surgical robots. But to give a little bit of context for this, I'd like to first step back and look a little bit at the intersection or the uh, communication between surgery, robotics, and uh, technology and society. Technology has the, option, uh, the possibility of helping us solve many of the big problems that face us today, from water to energy, and big technologies, which require an upfront investment, like desalinization or wind energy, have the potential to help us really break the back of some of these problems that face us. But one of the questions when we're investing in these types of technologies is, are they going to play out and give us the benefits that we think that they're going to have in the future? Or are we going to be left with a legion of unintended consequences because while we're in the midst of these technological transformations, it's often rather difficult to figure out where it's all going to end up. When we're also looking at technology, we need to understand that incremental changes in technologies are often going to incrementally move us towards a solution. But more radical changes in a technology give us the chance to perhaps leapfrog a little bit further. I've had the opportunity to be involved in really trying to upset some of the conventions when we're trying to solve some of these problems. This is the Helios uh, high altitude aircraft that I had the opportunity to be a member of the design team for in an earlier chapter of my life. And it shares very little from a design point of view with the aircraft that it shares airspace with or the satellites that it was intended to replace. And yet it can fly to the edge of the atmosphere. When we're looking at technology, we also need to understand that it can take 20 years for these technologies to come into common use in our society. And we're going to feel the effects of this over decades, not days. And so when we see these changes and we're in the midst of these technological transformations, we often really can't see where it's going to end up. But I do believe in healthcare, just like in energy and in water and in computers, we have the opportunity to really change and reframe the problems using these kinds of technologies. And wouldn't we all rather be in a world that's innovating its way out of scarcity rather than surviving by rationing old technologies? And so with that, I'm going to move to robots now. This is the Da Vinci surgical robot. What it does is it allows the motions of a surgeon to be shrunk down to very small instruments that can be placed in the body through very small incisions. Every motion, every nuance of what the surgeon is doing is translated into these instruments that are inside. You can even repair the heart from the inside of the heart without cracking the sternum. You just place the instruments in between the ribs. But like some of those other technologies that I was talking about, it requires a fairly large upfront investment in a big surgical robot. And so when we are, there are quite widespread use of these robots right now, they're in hospitals all over the world, but it still really is in very early stages of how we are seeing this technology will transform surgery. Granted, it doesn't uh, touch every aspect of the healthcare system, but it really does have a fairly large effect on how we do surgery. So we have to ask the fundamental question if we're trying to figure out where is this going to go, how on earth can a million dollar robot bring more value to the healthcare system than it's bringing in cost? And we really want to think about that from the point of view of all the different constituencies in the healthcare system, whether these are patients, the payers who are paying for the surgery of those patients, the providers who are performing the surgeries, and then eventually society as a whole. And so to understand this, we can first look at the payers, or the patients, rather. And for them, it's relatively more straightforward. If you take large incisions and get rid of them and instead give someone a smaller incision, and they will have less pain and they will be able to get back to work sooner. Now this only will help them in the long run if in the end you've given them a better surgery or at least an equivalent surgery. Now in the early days of an adoption of a technology, 
you really can't tell what those long-term effects are going to be. And so early on, we saw a lot of small studies that were looking at robotic surgery and the effects. But there were no, we simply didn't have enough data out there to do these large population-based studies. So they were largely absent from the literature. We're now at the stage where those studies can and have been done. And the geeks in the audience will be really happy. I'm going to get to the data. So this is a study that was done by a group at Harvard looking at a 100% a sample of the Medicare uh, database over a five-year period. And they looked at 78,000 surgeries, prostatectomies, uh, some done robotically and some done open. And when they compared the two cohorts, they found that people were going home on average a little over two days late, uh, earlier with robotics, fewer complications, fewer transfusions, and many fewer deaths. That same group went and looked at the healthcare uh, cost and utilization project database, which includes many younger patients that are privately insured in addition to the Medicare sample. And in the last quarter of 2008, they looked at a broad air, uh, swath of different kinds of surgeries that were being done and came to the conclusion in all of the ones that they looked at, there were demonstrable uh, improvements in every area of surgery. And in the 21,000 patient subset for prostatectomy, they again found that they were going home earlier, fewer complications, fewer transfusions, and uh, fewer deaths. In Europe, when you look at this sort of data, there's a very different kind of post-operative uh, course, and so patients tend to go home six days earlier in the European data that we've seen. In Canada, and also in uh, Ireland, closer, a little closer to home here, there was a meta-analysis done of the 95 studies chosen out of two, over 2,000 peer-reviewed journal articles looking at the outcomes in a wide variety of surgeries where robotic surgeries were being done. And they found that across the board, again, the, there were improvements with robotics, particularly notable in, notable in hysterectomy, where, again, they were going home quite a bit earlier and much better outcomes. And then they also duplicated some of the prostatectomy work, and that agreed with some of the larger studies. But while these studies were unanimous in their praise of the technology for the patient, they all had very strong criticisms about the cost of the technology. When you're doing a surgery with this robot, you've bought your robot, and you're having to amortize that over every surgery that you're doing. You're buying instruments. You have to maintain it. There's all sorts of costs associated with it. And the question is, are we going to bankrupt our healthcare system by getting these kinds of high-tech systems in to be able to do surgery? And so let's ask what the payers think of all of this, because they are the ones that are footing the bill for this. But it turns out in most of the markets, most of the countries where robots are being used currently, the payers pay no more money for a robotic surgery than they do for an open surgery or a laparoscopic surgery. And this is because they simply pay for the surgery, and it's up to the hospital how they're going to do it. There are a few exceptions to this, and they're mainly in healthcare systems where they've decided they want to pay more for the robotic surgery because they want to increase the incentives, because they see the downstream benefits of fewer complications and the patients going home sooner. But if we want to understand what is going on, why are the providers then perhaps footing the bill when the payers aren't paying extra for this, we want to look closely at a few different kinds of case studies, trying to understand what's going on here. Looking at a for-profit hospital in the United States in a competitive market, a hospital is marketing itself to a patient that have insurance. They want to uh, get them to their hospital. So if they invest in a high-tech toy, they can market themselves as being much more technologically advanced than that other hospital down the road, and all of the patients will start to come over to their hospital. But there's a very short-lived advantage because the other hospital is quickly going to retaliate. It's going to get its own robot, and the medical arms race is on. Pretty much all the hospitals start buying robots, and the advantage to different hospitals goes away. And so critics would say that this competitive behavior in the long run is really just driving up costs. Everybody feels that they need a robot to compete, and so they've all got one, but they don't really need them. And if this was the only uh, model that we were seeing, we would uh, 
wonder whether there was, if there was something else going on. But what we notice is that of more than a quarter of the hospitals out there that have robots have more than one. In fact, uh, and there are several hospitals out there that have only one that are contemplating getting more. Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic, respectively, have five and seven robots in their main hospitals and several more in their satellite facilities. And you've got to wonder what's driving this kind of behavior. And it turns out when you've made your big upfront investment and you're now using it to its fullest capacity, it's not costing you any more to have robot surgery. You're, the incremental costs are considerably lower. And it's still maybe not enough to drive the, the purchasing five robots. So then we have to look at what's going on. Why would they be getting quite so many? And it turns out if you look at, talk to the CFOs who are most heavily invested in robots, what they see this doing as preventing them from having to build any more hospital beds. Um, if you are doing surgery and the patient is going home in half the time, you can do twice as many surgeries to pass them through your hospital without having to build any more hospital. And this is what uh, a lot of these that are heavily invested in robots are doing. And as all of our societies have aging populations, we are either going to have to figure out how to more uh, efficiently use our hospitals, or we're going to have to be building more of them. So the Kaiser model is an interesting one also, where they uh, take care of the patients, they insure them, they do primary care, they own their own hospitals, and then they care for the patients after surgery. And what we see with them is they're heavily invested in robots, and they are using them to their fullest extent. And this is an interesting phenomenon, that the more economic interest you have in the long-term health of the patient, the more the robot uh, economics makes sense to you. This is one of the reasons why we see that this is not just a competitive US market phenomenon. The same group in Canada that was looking at the outcomes data in Canada looked at whether robots made a good investment for them. And they found if they used their robots for between three and 500 cases per robot per year, they not only broke even, they started to make more money. We also see this in healthcare systems in Europe over in Sweden, where they not only take care of the population cradle to grave, but also pay for all of the um, health care surrounding, you know, when, when they're off work after uh, surgery. They did a study where they wanted to see how long people took before they went home after surgery. And with uh, open surgery, people generally went home after 49 days, seven weeks. And with robotic, they were going back to work after 11 days. Now, they still groused about the upfront cost of this technology, but they recognized that that investment was good in terms of the overall healthcare system. So we've seen that there are benefits for the patients, the payers, the providers, and society, but these are really predicated on it actually being better, but also on having to use that technology. It's not every single, ro every single procedure is an incremental cost. You're paying up front. And what we see in a lot of these big uh, technological investments is that when you have made your big upfront investment and you have yet to see all the benefits downstream, you are wondering whether this was the right thing to do. <laughs> I mean, it, it's really, it's, it's not, the economics aren't looking terribly good yet. But like the big investments that we do in water and in energy, I believe that even though we don't yet know how all of this is going to play out, when we look back at this time of this technologically driven innovation and changes that are going on in medicine, we will see that they did bring a lot of value to our overall systems. And I think we should be bold about continuing to innovate and try to bring new technologies in to solve some of our most pressing problems. So thank you.